Hi, welcome to this episode of Patient Education for the Educated Patient. Here we're going to talk about the two most important questions on every pregnant woman's mind. Number one, is my baby okay? And number two, will my baby be okay between this appointment and my next appointment? So this is going to be a two-part video series. The first one, we're going to talk about the risk factors for stillbirth. And in the second episode, we're going to talk about what kind of testing you can do to help identify which babies are at the highest risk for stillbirth so that you can change course and intervene before something bad happens. So let's talk about the risk factors for stillbirth. Take home points. Number one, the risk of stillbirth is never zero, but it is very rare. The risk of stillbirth is often measured in number of events per 1,000 pregnant women, and that's still oftentimes less than one per 1,000. Number two, there are several risk factors for stillbirth, and that's what we're gonna talk about in the first part of this video series. Number three, antenatal surveillance and testing helps prevent some stillbirths, but not all stillbirths. It's not very good at identifying stillbirths related to congenital anomalies, cord accidents, placental abruptions, or things like intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. And number four take home point is antenatal testing is going to vary widely in terms of who to test, how often to test, which test to use. And so it can be very frustrating for patients because sometimes it's different with their First pregnancy versus this pregnancy, it's different from what they expected when they read it online. It's different from their friend who's pregnant. And so it can be very frustrating. Adding to the frustration is your insurance company is also going to have their opinion about how much testing is necessary, how much they're going to pay for, et cetera. So sometimes this can be a very frustrating point for our patients. So let's talk about the first risk factor. The first risk factor we're going to talk about is gestational age. And the reason I want to talk about this is because there's a lot of misinformation regarding the gestational age and risk of stillbirth. Intuitively, you would think that as the baby gets closer to the calculated due date, the risk of stillbirth would go down. And that's simply not true. There are some things where the baby will do better, such as their respiratory status if they get closer to the calculated due date. But things like stillbirth actually go up long before you get to your calculated due date. So let's take a look at this table here or this chart here. This chart here shows the risk of stillbirth on the y-axis. And again, this is number of cases per 1,000 deliveries. And on the x-axis, you have the gestational age. So from 20 weeks of pregnancy, which is the halfway point, all the way up to 42 weeks of pregnancy. Your calculated due date or your estimated due date is 40 weeks of gestation. And again, a full-term pregnancy is from 37 weeks to 42 weeks, technically. And so you can see that the risk of stillbirth is increasing starting at about 32 weeks, so about eight months of pregnancy. After that, your risk of stillbirth slowly but steadily starts climbing up. And it goes down starting at 20 weeks, naders between seven and eight months. So between 28 and 32 weeks is the lowest point and lowest risk of stillbirth. And after eight months, it starts creeping back up. So you have to keep that in mind when you're pregnant. The second thing is maternal age. And so intuitively, the older you are, the higher your risk of stillbirth is. But I think what's not intuitive is the dramatic increase in the risk of stillbirth the older you get. On this graph here, you can see patients that are over, that are 40 years old or older are denoted in this brown line. And you can see starting at about 34 weeks, it's substantially higher than the rest of the pregnant women. And after that, when you're 35 to 39 years of age in these blue triangles, it is also higher than the rest of the age group, but 
is not nearly as high as it is for patients who are 40 years and older. Also, what's not very intuitive is the other extreme of age. So again, patients who are 35 to 39, 40 to 44, and 45 years and older have a very high risk of stillbirth. But at the same time, patients who are very young also have a very high risk of stillbirth. Here, patients under 15 have also a very high risk of stillbirth. And so this graph accounts for both singleton pregnancies and twins and triplets. So you can see that the best age to be pregnant to minimize the risk of stillbirth is actually between 25 and 29. So that would be your Goldilocks age range. Again, you don't want to be too old. You want to be too young. But if you're pregnant, this is one of those risk factors. Unfortunately, you cannot modify. Your age is fixed. The only thing you can do is increase screening to help identify at what point the baby's too high of a risk for stillbirth and it's safer to get that baby delivered either by induction of labor or delivery by a scheduled C-section. So ethnicity also plays a role, which a lot of people don't appreciate. Here, black patients are graphed against Hispanic patients and white patients. And black patients, as you can see, for every single gestational age between 20 weeks all the way to 41 weeks, has a substantially higher risk of stillbirth. Again, these are relative risks. The absolute risk difference is not very much, but the relative risk is quite noticeable and pronounced. But these aren't the only risk factors. If you look at this paper, it lists several risk factors. Every single one of these risk factors is statistically significant, and there's three columns here. The risk factors, second column is the prevalence, and the third column's the odds ratio. But remember, with the incidence of stillbirth being as low as it is, the odds ratio is going to closely approximate the relative risk. So if you look at a lot of these risk factors, some of them are modifiable, some of them are not. BMI you can control, alcohol use, illicit drug use, how many antenatal appointments you go to, smoking, these are all things that are in your control. The highest risks for stillbirth are decreased fetal movement. And so we'll talk about that in the next part of this video series, but you can see the odds ratio is anywhere from four to 12 times higher for the odds of a stillbirth when you have decreased fetal movement. Other risk factors that are of note are previous C-section, previous stillbirth, growth restriction of the baby, either IUGR or severe IUGR, even diabetes and hypertension. These are all things that warrant closer surveillance in terms of risks for stillbirth. So again, the take home points, number one, the risks of stillbirth are low, but never zero. So again, a lot of these risk factors will increase the relative risk, but overall, the absolute risk is still going to be quite small and again, measured on the order of how many cases per thousand patients. Number two, there are several risk factors for stillbirth, which we've listed in this video. Number three, antenatal surveillance and testing can help identify which babies are at risk for stillbirth. And we'll talk about that in part two of this video series. And finally, don't let this be a point of frustration because the type of test, how frequently to do the test, which patients to test is going to vary widely between doctors, hospitals, and parts of the country. So don't let it be a source of frustration for you. Just know that as long as you're being screened and tested for, you and your baby should be okay. Hopefully you find that helpful. If that is, stay tuned for part two of this video series where we'll talk about the different tests that can help minimize your risk for stillbirth during your pregnancy. This is Dr. Chang. Stay healthy and stay educated. Thank you for watching this episode of Patient Education for the Educated Patient. I hope you found this content both helpful and meaningful and that you'll be able to use it to live a healthier life. If there's any questions, please leave them in the comments section below. I do welcome feedback, so please also leave me any comments or suggestions in the comments section.
Please subscribe and turn on the notifications, and I hope to see you at the next episode. Until then, stay healthy and stay educated.